Hello, my name is Anna Heringer from the UNESCO Chair for Earth and Architecture. I'm going to talk about handmade architecture and about how architecture can be a catalyst for development. For me, architecture is a tool to improve lives. And I don't mean just a roof on top of our heads, but I mean building up communities at the same time as we build up our buildings, building up self-confidence of the people, and building up skills, and offering a lot of work opportunities to the people, and also caring for a beauty and a cultural identity, because this is very strongly linked to dignity. I'm focusing not on the cities, but I'm focusing on the rural areas and on the reason why people move from the villages to town. And one of the reasons is that we found out with the NGO I'm cooperating with, with Deepshika, that they don't have really good education facilities for the people there. So the first project I did in the rural areas in Bangladesh, in the village Rudapur, it was building up a school with the people there. And um, whenever I start building a project, I look at three aspects, what local materials are available, what energy sources are available, and what, what skills are available. And in Bangladesh, um, we have, we have um, bamboo and earth as the local building materials draw, and the main energy source is, of course, people. And so we try to involve as many people as possible in our construction sites. So you see, um, we built our buildings very basically with water buffaloes and cows as the mixing machine. We built the walls up by hand. So we only use a spade to trim the walls that are made out of straw and earth only, no cement added, load-bearing walls. And um, we also use very basic methods for the bamboo construction. It's just a, a steel dowel and a lashing around the poles. And we, we always try to involve as many people as possible, also the, the future users of the building. So in that case, we had the children coming every afternoon on the site to help us and doing really some meaningful work because every person wants to be useful in a way. So it was a very important element of the school that we had, of this construction that we had really the children deeply involved in the construction. And they felt like they built the school and not just someone from outside came to build it. So this is the Metis School in Rundupur after six months of work. I did it together with Eike Roswag, an architect from Berlin. And it was my diploma project that time, so it's maybe encouraging for students. You really go out and build your projects. It's really fun. It's worth doing it, although it's a lot of str struggle, of course, and sometimes trials and errors, but it's really worth trying something. And um, as you can see, the, the facades are, are pretty raw. We wanted to show what's actually in the walls. It, it, there's just nothing besides the straw and the mud. Uh, but we kept the colors also as a, as a kind of a, a dialogue with the, with the raw facade of, of the mud. And the colors were very important to bring the emotions so the people are just really to accept that building and, and really like that building. And it's tradition in Bangladesh in the rural areas to sit on the floor. We kept this tradition and through these bolt holes that you see, they enter this kind of cave areas where they can retreat when, when they're done with their works. They can really get, go back and, and read for their own or they do, can, can do some little teamwork there or they can meditate. They do a lot of meditation there in the school. And of course, in the, in the breaks, it's also used for playing. So this is the upper floor with the saris on, under the roof. There's also an element you've, you find a lot in, in the rural houses. So I'm, when I'm designing, I'm always trying to, f to, to look what, what's existing in, in, in the potentials and get a lot in the village. And I'm really drawing a lot of inspirations from the place itself. And there's already so much beauty existing. You just have to take it and compose it in, in your personal way. And after the school, we did a housing project for, for the for the farmers in, in Rotopur in that area, also to show how they could use the techniques for their own houses and to improve their living conditions. And we did it together with um, students from the University Brack in, in, in Taka and also Studio Base Habitat in the University in Linz. So the main object of, of this housing um, project was to, to save land because Bangladesh is one of the countries that it has the highest um, density in population. And Strangely, most of the people expand horizontal-wise and are not topping up the buildings. And we were really motivating the people. You could save so much land if you add another story, which you can easily do with your own um, resources, with your, with your uh, materials, also without any crane or any really big equipment. You can just do it by your own hands. 
and you save the land for food cultivation, which is really crucial in Bangladesh. And that's the main um, responsibilities as architects and planners there to save land for, for food cultivation. Because it's, this is one of the main reasons why people move from the villages to the urban areas, because they don't have enough land to feed the family anymore. So this was the main objective of, of this project. And also to include the, the students, not just in the designing work, but also in the real construction. Because I believe that you need to know how much energy is in the wall, that you have a different relation to, to energy. Once, once you physically build the wall and you feel the blasters and your muscles, then you know how much energy it takes to actually build um, houses. And I think it's important to have a, a physical relation to that. And it's also, of course, you, you build differently, you design differently when you really know the material. And I think it's important to understand the material to make it really that you're not designing against the, the characteristics of that specific material, but within that characteristics that makes it economically more affordable and also, of course, more robust towards the climate. The clients were deeply involved in the process as well, as you can see on this picture. This Rohini and his wife. And uh, in terms of design and architecture, we try to be humble with these buildings, not to cause any social friction within the village. But as you can see in the neighborhood, you see very uh, the small huts. So it's kind of blending in, but still with the, with the two stories, it gives an, an impulse to really to, to go a step further in the development and really um, try out new things, new techniques and, and new designs and especially for saving land, it's very important. The other building that we built at the same time was uh, the Deshi building, which is a building for teachers. It's very important um, also in, to foster rural areas to mix the populations, that you're not just having farmers, but you also bring in like teachers, medical persons, and of course, um, you need good conditions to keep those people in, in those places. And we wanted to show that it's not usually when, when you have more money, you change the material and you go in, into materials that need a lot of uh, carbon emissions and energy. But we wanted to show that wealth doesn't necessar necessarily need to um, go hand in hand with changing the material. You can enhance it in, in putting even more time and design in the building and more craftsmanship, more refined craftsmanship. So in a way, they put the money into the people and not into the industries. That's what we wanted to show. Um, this is the, the building from the back. And you see the drawings. Um, they were actually the real site drawings. It was an absolutely participatory project um, since the project was not planned before the start. So it constantly changed during the process. Craftsmen were bringing in their know-how. I was bringing in my know-how. And, and the, the clients were bringing in their dreams and, and visions. So it was really like a, a, grow, a growing organism, this, this building. And, and it was really, for me, the, the main joy of, of, of this um, building, really the process to be so much involved with the people and really trust in what you have a feeling how it should look like in the end, but you don't have the full control in the sense that you have all the drawings all perfectly done. And I think this um, losing the perfection is kind of a way to really include a lot of people. In, in comparison to the other school, to the first building, we put in really even more craftsmanship and refined craftsmanship because we saw um, that a lot of um, professions that, for example, the basket weavers in, in the village, they're getting less and less work opportunities because also the, the buck, buckets from China, the plastic buckets are getting cheaper than, than the traditional baskets, although they're made locally. So they need new ways how to raise their income and, and how to how to use the potentials and, and the skills. So we just made kind of a bigger basket, basket as the facade with the, with the weaving techniques, as you can see here. And it gives a very refined atmosphere. And it's really something that people love when they come up and to the space, they really love the space. And they see, well, what, they're really astonished what you can do with the most simplest and basic materials. And this is what we wanted to show. We really wanted to tease the, the level of skills and not changing the material, as I said before, which is usually often happening when you have some money in your hands. So we also brought in a certain level of high tech, but also always in the aim that the building is autark again, that you're not depending on, on the high tech. So I'm not fond of this kind of sustainability that uses a lot of resources and then in the end put some solar panel on top of, of the roof 
And then we think through the high tech, we can make this building sustainable. It has to be sustainable from the very scratch on. And then the high tech, like the photovoltaic, is just the add on. Cities exist out of materials. And this is big business if we think it, if we multiply it um, with the number of inhabitants. And for me, it's always essential to think whatever I'm designing and I'm building, someone is getting the profit. And I'm, as a planner and architect, I have in the responsibility to divide it in a fair way. So if I'm building with Earth, I'm giving the money mainly to the people because Earth is available and it's cheap, but it's the labor that costs. So ultimately, people, the whole region is profiting from, from a bigger project. And if I'm buying the materials, then it's, or if I'm going to prefabricated elements like corrugated iron or panels or, or the cement blocks or whatever, I just make a few people happy with that. When I plan my buildings, I multiply the design seven billion times in my head. And I'm asking myself, do I contribute to more equality on this planet? Do I contribute to more cultural diversity on this planet? And how does it affect the environment? And as you can see the scenery now, um, when I'm going to Taka from my working area, I pass these miles of chimneys. And it really hurts me when I'm thinking that we put all this unnecessary carbon emissions and energy into this material to make this beautiful raw material earth in a way better. But in fact, I think we are really losing a lot of uniqueness and we can build fantastic architecture out of this raw material without all this energy involved. And we have examples of beautiful buildings all around the world in any kind of purpose, in urban structures, in rural structures, for palaces, for homes, and for hospitals. So, and humankind has always been able to use the potentials and the materials that we find on our feet are locally available to build beautiful habitats. And I think we have to start with this um, knowledge again, and we have to kind of um, reconnect ourselves to that kind of skills and we have to relearn that. And um, what I see in, in development work, we are always trying to find standardized solutions because it's controllable, because it's easy to plan. But in fact, we should really have in our mind that we are kind of also destroying a, a, the diversity, the cultures, and, and we really need to be more sensitive towards that. So here you see an example from Haiti where the planners were trying to bring in more individuality to the very standardized buildings. But this colors will eventually wash off and contaminate the groundwater. So I would really rather prefer a building process where the people are involved, where they have an opportunity to earn money, where they really can create some kind of ownership, a sense of ownership for the whole community also, not just their own building, because they were helping each other while building the buildings. For me, it's really essential that we go off from this standardized solution, that we really make site-specific, context-specific projects, that we add our global creativity to the local materials, to the local skills, and to the local potentials. And I hope this will contribute to more equality on this planet, at the same time, to more beauty and diversity.